Kevin, you get some extra time <laughs> for technical glitches. Can we start? Tell me when I can start, Judy. Let's go, Jay. Gabriel, let's go. Okay. Uh, Kevin first came to Nepal in 1975 through 1979 as an American Peace Corps volunteer, working on remote village community water supply projects in an area two weeks walk from the nearest road where I was also doing, did my doctoral research. He returned following four decades, uh, the following four decades to photograph Nepal and other regions of the Himalaya as recipient of Guggenheim, National Endowment for the Arts, Fulbright and Robert Gardner Peabody Museum Fellowships. He also conducted photographic expeditions to many other parts of the world from the Arctic to the Borneo to Middle East. His fine art photography is in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And as you will see from the photographs, it's, there's a reason why he has permanent exhibits. You look at his photographs and they transform you like all great photographers work does. So it's a, a really great pleasure Kevin, uh, to have you present some of your incredible work. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gabriel. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks so much, Gabriel. You know, the funny thing about Zoom is that Gabriel and I, with about uh, a dozen other friends who spent a lot of time in Nepal, uh, have had weekly and then bi-weekly Zoom conversations every Monday evening. And Gabriel and I've never actually met in human full form. We've, it's been all about Zoom. Um, even, and even though we were out in the remote Northwest Nepal at the same time, uh, it's a big piece of geography out there and we never, we just never happened to bump into each other. So Gabriel, thanks so much. I'm gonna to go to the share screen and uh, start a PowerPoint that I've put together and let me know if, uh, there are any technical glitches or anything like that. Um, the title of the talk, Confessions of a Bookmaker, 50 Years as a Photographer, uh, was not my original idea. Originally, I was going to talk about um, uh, traveling and going on pilgrimage to Mount Kailash and going on pilgrimage to Crystal Mountain and Dolpo. But um, uh, Dan Miller and other people have covered that territory pretty well. And so um, I said to Gabriel, well, I'll I'll talk about the book projects I've done. And the reason I wanna do that is because um, I've been very fortunate to produce uh, now a dozen books. And, um, and I put together this little text here to give thanks to everyone because I'm gonna miss a lot of names of a lot of people who've been very, very significantly helpful and important to my work. Uh, starting of course with my wife, Laura and my kids and my brother, Peter. Um, and it goes on and on the list of uh, mentors and people who have helped on all the different projects. So a blanket thank you to everyone um, who's allowed me to do my work. Um, growing up, I didn't think um, that I would be producing books. Uh, the first book of photography I knew was The Family of Man, a black and white uh, book of 500 images from 68 countries. And um, it's really an encyclopedia of everything one needs to know about photography and about life on the planet among humans from that one book. And I remember just studying it and poring over it endlessly. And, um, and when I look at these pictures now, I'm thinking probably Texas, maybe Alabama, Florida, this might be a book that ends up in the burn pile because it is about the diversity and um, brilliance of what life on the planet is. Um, Right on this two pages, you see Ben Sean on the left, and then Dorothea, two of Dorothea Lang's photos on the right, along with a beautiful Robert Frank photo and a Doris Ullman photo. These are, you know, great, brilliant artists. Uh, this book came out in 1955, uh, one year after I was born. And my brother, Peter, I know you're listening in. Um, we shared a bedroom through high school, and I kept this Life magazine cover uh, under a sheet of glass on the bookshelf next to where I would read. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at this portrait by David Douglas Duncan for a year and, um, and how powerful it, 
that always was for me. And then as I was putting the slideshow together, my Taman Shaman photo, I just realized, my God, there's that same intense uh, gaze from, the, from their eyes. And then there's also the same sort of gesture from the hand. I got to turn down my, uh, I got to turn down my volume here. Somebody called me on the landline. We got to call about once a month on that. Uh, and then I think John McKee's listening in today too. And um, John is a brilliant, brilliant man and brilliant teacher of photography. It's exactly five years ago this week, this month that I was enrolled in photo one at Bowdoin College with John. Uh, took us out camping on Isla Ho, uh, um, an island that we had to get to by the mail boat. Uh, this is a photo tour. And then there's John um, just a few days before Halloween, October up in Maine, uh, my last visit with John. So let's get to photography. One of the main things I learned from uh, John McKee and from photography at Bowdoin was the idea of not just taking the picture, but what the picture represents and, um, and what goes beyond the frame. And uh, one of our first assignments with John McKee was uh, to the edges and beyond. And we all were scratching our heads. What does he want? What does this mean? Where do we go to the edges and beyond? And it's really about thinking in terms of the photo as a finite rectangle that captures a piece of the world in a quick moment. And that beyond that, beyond the edges is so much more. And so how do you get that into a photograph, that idea of representing something significant, but also leading us to know that there's more beyond the edges of the frame. And the other takeaway for me that is always with me whenever I pick up the camera is the idea of counterpoint. So it's not just a picture of one thing, um, but when I make a photograph, I'm thinking of all the interrelationships. And it, you, know, you can just think of a, a jazz pianist and a jazz drummer and a jazz saxophonist, and they each have a solo, and then they might all come together and play as a unit, as an ensemble and then another one goes off and you end up with counterpoint, different leaders. And so I find that's true in photography too, that in the image of Labru, uh, Labru, the gentleman in the right-hand image, um, he still is in a uh, semi-coat running a shop now, but there he is 50 years ago as a young man uh, at a funeral for one of his friends in the village. This is the royal visit of the king and queen to Jumla Bazaar back in 1978. I turned my back on the king and queen because it was the audience that was what it was all about. And I learned that from looking at the work of Ouija, Robert Frank and others. This was my neighborhood in the Peace Corps up in Mugu district. Um, Dumbara, Dum means untouchable or Dalit. It's a pejorative um, term, but it's also the name of the village because um, that's just the hierarchical way life was established out in this part of Nepal. And what you can see here is a miniature representation of the extreme poverty that engulfed that entire part of Nepal, 75% infant mortality, perennial hunger. And then talk about counterpoint. You know, what is this picture of? What's the topic? Where's my eye supposed to go? And that's what I like about a good photograph is that there are no answers and the eye continues to travel through the image. I know that Sagar Lama is with us today, and he's from uh, uh, just a couple days walk from Barangsia, Homla. And this was um, 2017 at the Mani um, Tibetan New Year Festival with um, a friend, Pem Pema Lama, hosted me for almost a week, and Palden. You know, these are all Homla friends from out in the remote regions of Northwest Nepal. And then Rodi Coat, and again, this idea of counterpoint and the idea of to the edges and beyond. You know, this, this is a representation of the whole village. It's a microcosm of the larger village. And then this one also in Rodicote. And um, I think some people have a difficulty when images get complex like this. Um, and so, you know, here you have the, the one girl looking right back at me. And yet, you know, there's a hint of a larger festival and a larger event going on around us. So I'm going to jump into the books. And, um, you know, as I say, the first real photo book I got to see was Family of Man. And I didn't really imagine that I would become a photographer and that I would become somebody who produces books. And I've now had the very good fortune of producing a dozen of them. And I have two more 
moving along. This was the first book, 1970, 1993. I got an advance. Chronicle Books was really excited. They called me in for a meeting. They brought together the publisher, the editors, the you know, the whole staff of Chronicle Books was there. My first meeting with them. They offered me a big advance that I couldn't turn down. And uh, that was the way publishing was in 1993. Now I go out and have to gather all the money. Um, the book that uh, is coming out next year on the Uyghurs of Kashgar, I've raised $50,000 and I still haven't met the target of 60 that I need for the production of the book. So it, it's a very shifting landscape now. All of these photographs in Portrait of Nepal were taken with a view camera which means a large sheet film, four by five inch sheet film, throwing the black cloth over my head, focusing the image on the ground glass, and then um, processing all the film when I got back to the US. And I was also shooting Polaroid uh, large sheet film as well. So that I had to um, rinse and clean in the field and then hang up in my tent. And in monsoon, um, I actually had to have candles in the tent to dry, to create enough uh, dryness to dry the negatives uh, in the field. Uh, this is up in Limitang Humla, just uh, again, a couple days away from Sagar Lama's home up in Kermi Humla. The next book, two years later, uh, was kind of the same routine where the publisher offered me a nice advance and, um, and then they, I delivered them the artwork, Keith Dahman delivered the text. They put everything together and produced the book they sold rights to uh, a French publisher and also to Thames and Hudson in London. And um, again, this work also is a lot of the large format view camera work. Um, and I consider, <clears throat> I consider these photographs portraits of these ancient sculptures. This is Uma Mahaveshwar at the Kumbeshwar temple in Patan. This is a ninth or 10th century carving of Uma Parvati, the wife of Shiva. And you see the water on there and the color, the sundor. Uh, every day these uh, statues, sculptures are worshiped as living deities. And so if I were to photograph these same deities every single day, you'd see a different representation of the offerings that people have given. If you look carefully on the woodwork to the left, you can see the smoke coming off of the string incense. And then you can see a little bit of antipasto, um, you know, vegetable matter, a little bit of grains of rice, uh, flowers. And so this is what I really loved. It. Um, I, this is kind of a pilgrimage to go out and make images of these sacred sites. <coughs> this is one of the four Buddhas that marks the corners of what's called the Golden Temple or Kwabahal in Patan. And um, I go there every day I'm in Patan. Um, I make a visit to that temple. Um, I, I can't get enough. I'm always, uh, I always feel a sense of brand new, um, brand new renewal whenever I get back to Nepal and I revisit all these different places. This is the feet of another Umeshwar or um, a, a Parvati statue at Pashupati. And again, the display of offerings changes every day. My third book, um, Power, I'm sorry, Pilgrimage, looking at Ground Zero, yeah. came out. Uh, on the anniversary of 9-11. And um, the book, this book started out, I was down at the 9-11 site with a Japanese dancer friend who I was hosting here in Vermont and brought him to New York for his next performance at uh, the kitchen. And um, he wanted to see the 9-11 the World Trade Center site. We went down there together. And as I was photographing, plainclothes police, FBI, New York City police, <laughs> all kinds of people came up to me and said, put the camera away. If you aim the camera at the site again, we're going to take it away. This is an active crime scene. Don't aim the camera. So I put the camera, pivoted 180 degrees and looked over my shoulder. And I saw everybody staring into this abyss of what was the ruins of the uh, World Trade Center towers. And after a day, I went back. And then I went back for a third day and then I made four more visits down to lower Manhattan. And again, it was like a pilgrimage. I would go down to the 16 acre site and I would circumambulate checking the light and the angles <laughs> to make all these different photographs. And this very quickly became a, 
a book called Pilgrimage Looking at Ground Zero. And, um, and this work was collected by many, many museums um, as a testament to what 9-11 represented. And what people appreciated was that this was not of the ruins, it was not of the flag, it was not angry, but it was a quiet look at people's individual grief. This is one of my favorites. And um, she's married to Tony Egan. I don't know her name, but Tony Egan is Irish. He got in touch with me years ago and wanted copies of this photo for his mother-in-law to be and for his wife to be as well. So um, next book, Mao Body. Um, and you're probably wondering what's Mao Body? Well, Mao Body in Nepali means the Maoist party or the Maoist uh, rule. And um, this book came out, I made the photos in 2010. I got quite sick out in Northwest Nepal on my uh, Robert Gardner Peabody Museum Fellowship. So I was kind of stuck in Kathmandu and Kanak and Kunda Dixit, two uh, well-known journalists in Nepal, gave me phone numbers for Prachanda, the, uh, the leader of the Maoists. And, uh, and so I had a lot of conversation with Prachanda's son. Could, and I, all I wanted to do is portraits of, you know, Prachanda and other Maoist leadership. It didn't happen, but um, he gave me the number of uh, Ananta, uh, Barsaman Pun Magar, the supreme commander of the, uh, of the Maoist fighters. And he invited me up to his house. We talked for two hours. He told in Nepali, and at the end of the conversation, he said, Kevin, you know Nepal better than I do. You know my country better than I do. What do you want? I said, I want to go to the cantonments and do portraits of the Maoist combatants. He said, okay, I'll, I'll give you two hours. And I said, I can't do anything in two hours. I need at least six. He said, okay, I'll give you four hours. Well, four hours turned into more than four days. We went to the Shakti Kaur cantonment, the Aron Kola cantonment, and created a book um, of the portraits. And the idea was that the book would show the humanity of people who were also fighters in a civil war that did so much havoc uh, in the country of Nepal. Uh, the next book, um, this came out in 2014. And again, my thanks to Robert Gardner, who was a great friend and mentor for 30 years. And um, we collaborated on a number of books with the Film Study Center at Harvard. Uh, but this is a major retrospective book, um, about 150 photographs. And it goes back to my earliest Peace Corps experience, as well as up to photographs that I was making in 2010 on the Peabody Fellowship. Uh, this you see, this was all destroyed during the earthquake. And um, when I think of the earthquake destruction from 2015, um, I'm then reminded of what we're seeing now in, in Ukraine. It's one thing if you have an earthquake that lasts a minute or two, uh, but it's another thing to have nonstop bombard intentional bombardment. I uh, just had to mention that. So I'm working here with the view camera. Now I'm working with the medium format camera. Um, this is a very interesting photograph, the pelt of the snow leopard. Uh, and we're down on the Indian border actually here with uh, Prem Singh's father who hosted us. Uh, Karani Tar village, uh, where I put a water project in with Bharat Jammu Preti in 1976. And Karani Tar was a beautiful idyllic village overlooking the confluence of two rivers. <clears throat> by 1987, the motor road was coming in, electricity was coming in. And, and so you just have urban sprawl and three and four story tall concrete buildings there now. And of course, 87 was the beginning of the television revolution in Nepal. But even in the same time, lack of roads, lack of medical care. And it was not unusual to see people uh, being brought to a medical facility by what I call the human ambulance. And then a lot of these sort of time-lapse images on the left is uh, Karma Guru and his sons in 1985. And then um, 31 years later, there's Karma Guru. Uh, his son on the, on the left is now a doctor. And the son on the right is a reincarnate Lama. Uh, and both sons travel extensively and are having incredible careers. Sonam Tsering was my blood brother back in 1977 in Humla. Here he is um, as a great grandfather, still in his village of Diga. Honda Lama, 
Honda and her girlfriends used to come up and deliver food to Craig Thompson and I. Uh, we were living way up in the jungle, uh, way above the village building as the water project was coming through the high altitude alpine forest. And, um, and what's interesting is in 1985, she looks kind of haggard, but um, 20 years later, she's looking, or 30 years later rather, she's looking pretty, uh, pretty active and pretty energetic there. Um, Shaman Tsumpton uh, Chombel in Limatang on the right goes way back to 85. In 2017, when I took the color picture of him, we were talking and, um, and he said, I'm the last shaman of Limatang. We, we have no use for shamans anymore. Look at, you, you know, people have the internet, people have phones. They don't need me to tell them what's happening uh, to their nephew or to their uncle or to their grandparents in another part of Nepal. They can just give them a phone call. So it was just interesting that he had already accepted change and the obsolescence of his career as a shaman. And then these are more time-lapse images between 1985 and then returning on my Fulbright in 2016-17. Um, and the object of my Fulbright was to look at the same region, go back, re-photograph it, and see what the impact was of electrification, mini hydroelectric, and also the coming of motor roads. There's Dawa, uh, Dawa Lama of Wotik. And um, what was incredible was how everybody seemed to be doing pretty okay overall. 2016, uh, this is an example of how something like wine, you know, some photographs uh, ripen and, and get even richer and better over time. Uh, this book didn't come out until 2016, but all the photographs were made between 1981 and 83. So here we are 30 years later, and there's this incredible nostalgia now for these photographs. Um, there's a, a TV show called uh, La Vida Loca on Stars Network. Um, and uh, one of my, the cover photo of this book is now kind of the signature image of that book, of that, of that TV series. Um, but I just, uh, I, I get an incredible sense of the energy that I felt as a young person and also of just what New Mexico looked and felt like. And actually right now I'm going back to all the New Mexico imagery from 1981-83 and finding all kinds of other images of um, different little communities that I photographed way back then and how everything has changed so much with the sprawl that one finds now in New Mexico. There's Leroy Perea on his Holy Thursday pilgrimage to Chimayo back in 1981. Uh, this is a, a really fun book. Uh, and I have to say that this couldn't have been done without Sienna Craig, um, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Dartmouth College. Uh, Sienna, I knew a little bit through uh, the post-earthquake um, uh, symposia that she hosted at, at Dartmouth. And so when Laura and I were on our way to Mustang, I was down in Pokhara and I popped an email off to her from uh, the town of Pokhara. When our plane landed in Jomsom, there was a response from Sienna, you know, pages long, filled with details of who to see, where to stay, whose food to eat, which village to stay in, which hotel. And so it's just like this roadmap for us uh, to travel through Mustang with. And so when I got back, uh, these by the way are all images from my phone and um, I showed them to Sienna <coughs> and I said, Sienna, what do you think about doing a book together? And sure enough, uh, we did. And this book of all things won the, uh, the book of the year award with the LA, the Los Angeles um, photo, the Los Angeles photo group. So, uh, so it got some good attention, but all of these were, are with the phone. And what I liked about the, this app that I use is the square format and kind of a vintage quality to the imagery um, that also makes it look like the old two and a quarter square images I was doing with the Roloflex and then also with the Hasselblad. That's the back cover image. And um, just reminds me of something out of Boonwell or Fellini or something like that. I'm really delighted that uh, listening in today, uh, Abhimanyu Pandey is here from Heidelberg. 
And um, this has to be one of my favorite books as far as the production and working on it. Abi, Manu, and I would meet daily for breakfast um, at, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the cafe right now in Patan. Um, but we were on the pilgrimage tour. It was about a month long journey from Northwest Nepal in and into uh, Tibet and around Mount Kailash. And one of our guides, uh, Sagar Lama, is listening in today as well. So I just want to say hi to Sagar. For, and Sagar has been my um, go-to guy on my other trips out to Northwest Nepal as well. Uh, but working with Abhi was a treat. And uh, Abhi contributed most of the text of the book. And um, just a, such a compatible, warm, and friendly soul. And, uh, and it made the book just uh, so much fun to work on together. Uh, and then here's one of our fellow pilgrims, uh, uh, that's Pasang Yangji Sherpa, who I think is living now up in the Seattle area, a PhD in anthropology as well. And, um, and then, you know, it's one thing to walk around a sacred mountain, but it's another thing to lay your body out and then step forward the length of your body and do another prayer, a full prostration. And so you find many of these pilgrims slowly, slowly working their way around the mountain. A fast Tibetan can make the circumambulation in a day. Our group took three days. And then some of the people who are doing the slow circumambulations might take even a month to uh, quietly go around the mountain. These two young men aren't even using the path. They're just going up over the rocks up the cliffs and through the snow, doing their full body prostrations, the full length of the journey. And then there was one Bumpo uh, pilgrim I met who was doing the pilgrimage every day, walking the entirety, and this includes an 18 and a half thousand foot pass. And this man had done the pilgrimage every day, uh, almost every single day for the past two or three years. He was, he'd clocked uh, between six and 700 circumambulations. Um, I was in Syria in 2003. I have to look at the clock. We're still, I hope we're okay. In 2003, um, Lou Werner and I made an assignment for ourselves to Syria because Bush had just started the war in Iraq and we thought there was probably going to be collateral damage drifting into Syria, you know, refugees and all of that. Uh, we had no idea that actually you know, uh, by 2010, that Syria would be engulfed in an absolutely horrific civil war. And so what you're looking at on the cover of the book is uh, the remnants, the ruins of San Simeon uh, post earthquake hundreds of years ago. Uh, but then uh, the, um, the fighting in Syria leveled uh, this, the, the remaining uh, beauty of that site the fighting also destroyed the monument, monumental arch in Palmyra. Our assignment was to go into Aleppo and meet with shop owners, make their pictures, tell their stories. And then, you know, this is in 2003, in less than a decade, all of Aleppo was bombed, leveled, uh, first by fighting between the sides in the civil war, firebombing the entirety of the Aleppo souk. And then when Putin and Russian forces came in, they barrel bombed the entirety of the city. So um, let's hope that uh, Ukraine doesn't go that badly. By the way, that's Lou Werner sitting on the stoop there. Um, he, he almost looks Syrian at a distance. And then this is in one of the old beehive style houses north of Aleppo. Again, most probably most of that was lost in the war as well. These keystones at Rasafe, this is just a mind boggling visual for me uh, when I discovered this and the way the sunlight was hitting it. And um, just so exciting to find this, you know, third century remnant of the, uh, the uh, cathedral and sacred spaces commemorating Saint uh, Sergiopoulos, who was a Sergio, a Roman soldier martyred for becoming a Christian. And then the beauty of Palmyra, uh, you know, a um, Middle East city that was key to the Roman Empire, it was kind of the, the crossroads uh, city linking uh, East and West in its time and linking 
uh, the Rome and the Holy Land as well. Our Voices, Our Streets. Um, this book, the, the funny thing about this book, by the way, I have to thank uh, Howard Zinn, who in 2006 wrote the introduction for this book. This book didn't come out until 2020. Um, it was a long haul. Uh, for many years, nobody wanted to look at any of this work. People said, we know what that looks like. We don't want to look at it. It's ugly. It's brutal. This is not an America we want to look at. It, it makes us feel uncomfortable, was what a lot of people said. Then there was the murder of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, and the Trump presidency in general. And after all that, when this book came out, people said, well, it's, it's nice, it's, it's nostalgic, it's, it's, um, it's really old world, it's really quiet. It doesn't have that energy and that anger that we have in America now. So it shows how photographs, the same photographs, can be interpreted in so many different ways by so many different peoples, depending on the, the political climate, depending on who the viewer is of the images. This is a really wonderful image for me, the young boy to the right, and then Che Guevara and um, Jesus Christ and Martin Luther King, these kind of three icons of people's, uh, people's choice of, of who they want to uh, be their leader. And then of course, you've got the above the fold uh, half picture of uh, Bush. This is taken on his second inaugural. January 20th, 2005. And then the curious signage that you see, everybody has a different way of expressing themselves. Um, if you want peace, prepare for war. I didn't quite get it, <clears throat> but this image to me was looking back to the images of what the, what the American flag represents in Robert Frank's images, for instance, or Gary Winogrand's or uh, Diane Arbus's work. And then speaking of Diane Arbus, when I saw this um, disabled American Iraq war veteran in his wheelchair with his backpack in his lap, um, I couldn't help but think of the Diane Arbus photo she took on, on a Halloween of an older woman in a wheelchair, also same mask, same composition. So I'm always sometimes working um, through my photographic memory. Uh, this is a book that is going to print next week. Um, there's been COVID and there's been rioting and there's been paper shortages and supply chain issues of other kinds. But I just heard from Norbu Lama, the designer of this book uh, this morning that the paper is there. The book will go to press this week. Um, it'll take about a week and then it'll take a week to bind it. And, um, and so we should be having books available in Kathmandu by the end of March, if not even a little sooner. Um, and again, you know, I, I heard about the earthquake. I was teaching full time at Green Mountain College and couldn't get away. So I didn't get to Nepal until a month after the quake. And so the rescue was over. Um, but what was left was just the cleaning up. And so I ended up uh, spending a lot of time photographing what I call the building breakers, these young men and women who came to the quake affected areas to make money, to earn money. And these men are living in the building they're destroying. So they're now living on the second floor. By the time they take the roof off of the floor above them, they'll move down to the next floor. They chip away holes in the floor and shuffleboard and dump all the debris from one floor to the next. And uh, so for me, that's what a lot of the, um, the post-earthquake coverage was about, was uh, spending time with the building breakers, telling their story. This is the Yellow Gompa, uh, the Kagyu Gompa up at uh, Swayambu. If you look at the debris on the floor there, the broken plaster of the monastery, it's almost hard to distinguish between the broken plaster and then the urban sprawl uh, down below across the city's landscape. This is Anisha Shrestha. Uh, at the time she was walking uh, twice a day through this ruin. It was the only way to get from her home to school. And um, this is just what became normal. And there's the book. So it is on its way. 
I don't know how the books will get from there to here, meaning from Kathmandu to here, um, but I'm looking forward to seeing a copy. Um, next book, this is coming out in 2023. And um, this, this book has $50,000 of funding uh, and needs 10,000 more. Um, it's an important book um, and it's a co co-authored between me as photographer and then Tahir Hamid is Gil. Uh, Tahir is um, probably the leading uh, literary voice of the Uyghur diaspora. And so I'm of course paying him well, and then I'm paying translators well. And what we want to end up with is a, a book that uh, it will not say returning to Kashgar, it'll say Kashgar before the catastrophe will be the cover title. And the book will be entirely bilingual, English and Uyghur. So this book ideally will find its way to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, across Europe and elsewhere to the Uyghur community. And they will be able to read the text if they are not fluent in English. And here's Tahir. Um, there's a large profile that came out on July 14th to uh, 2021. Here's a short quote of his from um, his poem, Returning to Kashgar. This is from one of our Zoom conversations, Mutalip Anwar, who's one of the two translators with Darren Byler. And then there's Tahir at home. Uh, he's also World Uyghur Writers Union director. And um, his text is gonna be uh, quite a bit about, about his personal story uh, with Kashgar. And the irony or coincidence is that he was um, in a labor camp for three years and was released in late 1998, within a week or two of the time that I also arrived in Kashgar in 1998 to make these photographs. So of course we never met, uh, we still have not met other than by Zoom, uh, but, we have, but there's a confluence of our time together in Kashgar when it was the ancient city of Kashgar. What's happened since 2008, uh, 2006 or eight, uh, a major crackdown on all the Uyghur people and the entire old city of Kashgar has been bulldozed under and recreated in concrete. And over a million, well over a million Uyghurs have been incarcerated in re-education camps, labor camps, and um, and in prison, you know, prison and torture as well. So these pictures show the old streets of Kashgar, uh, which no, are no longer original, these original old streets. Um, and so what I wanna show in these photographs is the, the vibrance of the old world that was Kashgar before the catastrophe, before the leveling. I'm keeping an eye on my clock. I think this is the last image. And, um, and this is a significant one because just metaphorically speaking, the young boy in the cage and the idea of, um, of incarceration of the entirety of the Uyghur people of, of Western China in Xinjiang. And uh, one last image, solidarity with Ukraine. It's actually taken right here in Shaftesbury, Vermont. I'm gonna um, stop sharing and go back to uh, a human being with a face and a voice. Well, uh, speaking on behalf of the entire crew here, uh, that was fascinating. Uh, so the, uh, a lot of questions coming up, but let me take the first one and then we're gonna have people in the audience online and people in the audience in the auditorium alternate. So if you've got a question, what you wanna do is put it in the chat and we'll pick it up. So my question, uh, Kevin, is if you were 20 years younger, okay, given the way the world is now, where would you focus? Uh, <laughs> 20 years younger, I'd still be pretty old. So uh, where would I, um, I would, if I didn't have a family and I didn't have a worry in the world, I, I would go to Poland. Okay. I would go to Poland. Uh, yeah. Okay. And I'd bring a camera and I would uh, do what I could. 
Okay, uh, are there any questions in the auditorium? Do we have any questions here? Yes, we do. Hold on, George, I'll get right for you. Many of your photos are in black and white. Uh, do you have a preference? Do you think black and white conveys a different message than color? Yes, the black and white's got a austere power to it. Um, and my, my love for black and white, of course, starts with the dark room, watching the, the print emerge on the paper and the, under the amber light and the developer, just a beautiful alchemy to making black and white photographs. I have an Epson printer now and I can make four by five foot color prints. Um, but I'm just pushing a button and uh, out comes the beautiful print. So yeah, a lot of my love for black and white goes back again to um, the family of man and uh, the photographs of people like David Douglas Duncan, Eugene Smith, Robert Frank, all those uh, great people. Dorothea Lange, just a genius with a camera. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, for me, the, the black and white, there's just something very uh, connective about it. And, you know, with, with color, you know, I, back in the old days, 50 years ago, I would shoot the pictures and then a yellow box of Kodachromes would come back and you'd kind of hold them up and look at them. And uh, there just wasn't that visceral human connection uh, that I have to black and white. Maureen? You unmuted yourself. Do you have a separate question or do you want to ask the quick one? Uh, yes, I, I was wondering what type of equipment do you use now? What type of um, camera? Right, I have two, uh, two types. One is this one, the phone. And uh, I, you know, it's an iPhone 12. I use it all the time. And uh, hold on. And then, uh, and then this one, this is a, a Sony um, A7R III. And, it, and the capture on this is uh, 45 megapixels. So every time I click the shutter with this, I can uh, put out a print from my Epson printer four by five feet with complete fidelity, better than what I could get with the four by five inch view camera negatives. Um, and so what happens now is I've got, I literally have 20 or more external hard drives with data. I'm a terrible editor. I'm a terrible pack rat. <laughs> and, and so I just have, I'm, I'm drowning in images and uh, old and new. Um, but uh, the, the nice thing about that Sony camera is it's a mirrorless camera. So it doesn't have the bulk of what's called an SLR when you're actually using a prism to view through the lens. And it takes a while to get used to seeing everything as though it's on a mini television screen rather than a real, um, a real image. But, uh, but the technology is brilliant. It's really stunning what it can do. Do we have another question from the uh, auditorium? Do we have any questions? Go ahead, George. Okay, uh, Maureen had a slightly technical question. Where is Kashgar? Kashgar is, um, it was considered the heart of the Silk Road. If you go from Pakistan straight north up the Karakoram Highway, you get to Kashgar. If you go straight east across uh, Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, you end up in Kashgar. And if you go from Beijing west um, and you go all the way to the end of Xinjiang, the far west, you end up in Kashgar. So it's a pivotal, very important uh, place going back to the Silk Road. And now it's an extremely pivotal, important place because of what's going on as we see playing out now in the international geopolitics of Russia, China, and other players. And, and Kashgar sits right on that fault line between these two worlds right now. Okay. Uh, other questions from this end? I can probably catch you if you raise your hand. I, I see one from, uh, from my brother, Peter. 
asking ask, asking if I'm going to go back to the old New York City photo. <laughs> well, I I was a couch surfer before people even used the term couch surfer. I slept on uh, Peter shared his apartment with me off and on for years. Uh, what a brother! What a great helpful guy! But I did. I have hundreds of rolls of pictures from New York City, going all the way back to high school when we would take family trips and I would wander away and go down to the Fulton Fish Market and the Bowery as a kid, as a 14 year old. Um, so I have just, yeah, an incredible body of work. And um, I've already spoken to David Skolkin, who's designed three of my books um, about doing something with all that old New York stuff that's now 40, 50 years old. And um, I love New York, and I want to I want to share those images because New York is such a wonderful city. Just um, and and I think the photos are really uh, there's always that love and curiosity about the city and about what's down the street. And I just want to mention Abe Morell, who is a, um, a, a college friend. We were at Bowdoin together with John McKee as our professor. And, uh, and I used to stay at Abe Morell's place during college as well. And, um, and just there was nothing like walking the streets with Abe uh, back in my late teen years, you know, seeing what's around the next corner in New York. Um, have you ever considered writing a book about how to take photographs? Um, I haven't. No, I haven't considered that, but I um, but it would be fun to gather a, a series of photos and, and let each photo tell a story. And it can be a the the story of what's in the photo content wise, but also about photograph, about how to make the photograph and what um, what means come into use to make that specific photograph. That's a great idea. It's been done, but <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, where did Yeoman go? Do, do you want to ask your question directly? I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, I have a question. Go to it. Uh, hi, this is Michael McKeon. Can I be heard? Yes, you can. Hi, oh, Michael. Okay. Hi, Kevin, that was wonderful. Uh, it was wonderful to see the, the full panorama of your work laid out chronologically. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, to talk a bit about uh, something that I uh, that was obvious early on when I first saw your early photographs of Nepal. Um, the way that you, in those days anyway, posed figures uh, very often in a way that made one feel that um, that they were that, that your photographs were composed as though they were uh, paintings, uh, and they often entail uh, two or three figures, uh, very characteristically posed in front of the camera, perhaps um, holding something. At least as as you explained that they felt was important to them. I wanted to ask you about your attitude toward posing, toward getting your subjects to pose. What difference that makes, how it's different from the other photographs that you take? What a perfect question. Um, the, the nature, a lot of it has to do with the nature of the medium. The 35 millimeter uh, camera can easily be carried in the hand and it doesn't even have to be held to the eye. You can just, you know, shoot from an arm's length, which a lot of photographers have done, uh, you know, William Klein, Gary Winogrand and countless others. And, and now I do that with the phone as well. But the, um, the formal portraits that ended up in the book Portrait of Nepal, those are extremely deliberately composed. The camera's on a tripod. And a lot of the photographs are made in very remote parts of Nepal where uh, just my walking into the village is an intrusion and an, and a, an event but then you put up a tripod and you bring out the camera and you throw the black cloth over your head and all of a sudden you are, the photographer is the, uh, the event. And, and so a lot of those photographs are about 
navigating the space between subject and photographer to get them to a place of comfort and ease to uh, be somewhat natural. And, and then also depending on me to, to try to understand what is real, what is natural, what to represent. Um, and of course, in John McKee's class, I remember seeing Irving Penn's book, Worlds in a Small Room. Irving Penn went around the world for either Vogue or Vanity Fair for many years with a, with a tent. And he would put up the tent in Pokhara, Nepal, or in you know, uh, Cameroon or Morocco, and put people inside the tent and very deliberately and carefully pose them just like a shoot for Vogue or Vanity Fair magazine. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I had an introduction to Irving Penn back in the uh, late 1980s. And I had a long conversation with him and he loved my work. And he said, Kevin, I could never do that. Um, I have to have control. I have to, uh, I can't just walk into the village and be, a, and be at home. Uh, so a lot of the, the portraits I did in Nepal with the view camera are a product of my feeling comfortable having lived in specific villages mm -hmm. and knowing the nuance of daily life there and um and having an idea of what was significant um so yeah the, those photographs people do uh people have made comments about those formal portraits that i did in the 1980s uh kind of love hate and um charles ramble in the the big retrospective book that harvard and radius books did years ago uh charles ramble in the introduction talks about that that tension between loving the photos because they're so lustrous and beautiful and the light and the fabric of what people are wearing and what they show. And yet, and yet there's also that sort of romantic Victorian um, explorer going into the unknown world. And, and so, yeah, there is that tension, but, um, but to use a long lens and, and candidly photograph people while they, pound grain or you know sweat as they break bricks or carry a load up the mountain you know what what is the authentic and real photograph and um and then who am i as an american going out to ne literally to nepal's remotest regions of all and uh what entitles me to go there shouldn't there be a nepali making those images and yet if i did my peace corps three years out in those villages Maybe I know more than a Nepali who grew up in a suburb enclave of Kathmandu and has never been out into the mountains. It's like, I don't know Vermont. I know my neighborhood, but I'm not, um, I'm not the anthropologist of Vermont. And so, yeah, photography, we all take liberties and, I, um, and all the ethics also of what, what is documentary and what is fine art photography. And um, so, yeah. And, so Michael, I'm always thinking about these issues. And the, the book that's coming out very soon, Nepal Earthquake, uh, you know, I, I got to Nepal a month after the earthquake and, and who was I to, to make a book called Nepal Earthquake? And I've had endless conversation with Deepak Tapa, my editor. And Deepak was the one who decided to include in the book 18 pages of my personal journal. And I said, Deepak, this is crazy. I guess. He said, no, no, it's, it's authentic. It's, it's real. It, it gives people context about what was there. But, you know, how did I end up making those images and then bringing them to print in a book? How did I, sitting in Vermont during 9-11, end up making a book about 9-11? And a lot of it was because New Yorkers had a complete aversion to going downtown. Our friends, Toby and Charles, never went downtown. Mm -hmm. So many New Yorkers never went downtown. I went Vermont, from Vermont right down to the World Trade Center site. So a lot, I guess a bit of, a bit of the answer is, yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about what I see. And, and it's a very subjective and personal choice about what ends up as the photograph. David, you had a question. I'm going to go to David next. 
Oh, yes. Yeah, um, I actually, the question I had was kind of a follow up to that. Um, it was inspired by that. How do you see the intersection, <clears throat> the intersection between art and photojournalism? Um, and, you know, how do they mix? What are the differences? What are the different intentions? Because, you know, obviously photojournalism is in some ways art and art it depends on, it uses photojournalism, yet they can be two different worlds. Um, and you also mentioned something about the subjective thing, which is, you know, of course, we've all been brought up to think that the journalism world is an objective world, but we know that that's not true. So I'm wondering, just, it's kind of a broad question, but what's your perspective on how the two mix? Yeah, I, um, I always look uh, to the photograph for its aesthetic power and its emotional power. And um, those are kind of the, the barometers that I judge photography on. But when you talk about the difference between photojournalism and, and fine art photography and the aesthetics of an image, it, it reminds me of, um, of uh, James Nakwe. And um, I've always admired James Nakwe's work. I've always shown my students the film War Photographer. James Nakwe is considered to be the the great and most important war journalist of the late 20th century. And he and I had a chance to show our work together after the Nepal earthquake. We had a joint show up at Dartmouth. And, um, and we have very different ways of doing things, uh, but we have a common denominator of caring about the aesthetics of an image. <clears throat> and if you look at, at uh, Jim's uh, personal history, he was an art history major at Dartmouth. So he's very aware of. Jan van Eyck, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Picasso, Matisse, you know, and so when he goes into the, wor the worst places on earth during war or famine, he can't help but be thinking about the aesthetics of the image. And so if you know his work, it's extremely hard to look at, it's extremely tough, um, but there is an aesthetic to it. And, and then the question is, does the aesthetic remove um, the power, the visceral power of images. Um, and I have no answer. I mean, the, and, and then you look right now at this very moment, um, there are countless people with their phones who are uploading images and videos of what's going on in Ukraine and the bombing. And, um, and, and so, you know, that goes even beyond journalism because it's just what is, it's fact. And, um, and so there isn't even the, um, the filtration of, of CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, whatever, you know, instead of just this direct feed of life. So it's almost like there's a locked off camera. Um, so it's, a, it's an excellent question. And, um, and when you aestheticize something horrific, um, does it diminish it? You know, it, it just, it's such a hard one. Um, the, uh, the earthquake images, uh, Nepal earthquake, you know, the, yes, those photographs are beautiful. I like looking at them because of the color and the compositions. And yet there's also a story there that's, that's very painful as well. So yeah, it's a, I don't have an answer other than that I'm aware of the-, the Kevin, the, we, have two, we have two more questions. Um, sure. There's one in the Burr Auditorium and then I'm gonna mess up the name horribly. Uh, Amin Maya Pandey in Germany has a question. Well, we'll go to the auditorium first. Before we do that, however, I'd like to remind people next week, um, our speaker is Diana McDonald, our new council uh, representative, uh, a very important person to Oakmont. And assuming that we're a little clearer on the situation with regard to COVID, uh, I hope we'll see as many of you as possible in Burger for that meeting. Okay, having said that, we're gonna go to Burger. Can you discuss why it is so difficult to um, fund your work, why you have to do the fundraising? <laughs> I oh. mean, you said you've, ra you've raised 50,000 of, of the needed 60,000. Right. Yeah, um, this is, you know, that first time, the first book, uh, Portrait of Nepal, uh, it was Irving Penn who said, uh, Kevin, go to Shermer Moselle. They're the best. That's where you wanna go. And I, that's what I was thinking, but I sent a packet of stuff out to San Francisco 
And then when I got to San Francisco that morning, my first morning, I called Chronicle Books. I said, did you get my package? I said, oh, I, I don't know. I said, oh yeah, here it is on my desk. And he opened it. And then he looked and said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I'll, give you, I'll get back to you. And an hour later, they called and said, be here at 1.30 this afternoon. And they had everybody there and they were ready to write a check and do the book. I never reached out to Shermer Moselle. That was, you know, 1992. Everything has changed now. Um, and uh, all of my books take money and I've had to raise the money for them. And I wanna say, um, I don't know if John Scanlon is watching um, the Zoom today, but uh, the Scanlon Family Foundation has been extremely helpful on my last three books. Um, the uh, Furthermore Foundation of the J.M. Kaplan Fund has been very significant. And also the Luce Foundation, uh, really significant in my work and my brother Peter as well. And, and um, Michael McKeon and Carolyn Williams and other individuals and other people who've bought a few photos to help out. It, it is a struggle. Um, this is not a cookbook and I'm not AOC. Um, you know, if you're a rock star, uh, there's a good chance you'll get a nice big advance uh, or a politician or something. But, but these kinds of books are very tough. And I, um, my last books, um, Our Voices, Our Streets and Legacy in Stone, Syria Before War, those are both printed in Verona at uh, Bertal Edizione Bertalesi, the second or third best printer in the world. Uh, that's what I want. That's what the book is about. It's about quality and it, and it takes money. And the Our Voices, Our Streets was only printed two years ago. Uh, costs have gone up 25% at least since then because of supply chain issues, paper costs and shipping costs. Uh, and that's with the same, uh, the same printer. So that's why it costs money. Um, I think when it comes to Kashgar and it comes to the genocide of the Uyghur people, yeah, I don't know why I have to go out and knock on doors, but, but I do. <laughs> it's the way it works. Okay, we're going to close out with a question from Amin Manya in uh, Germany. Hi, Abi. <laughs> I think, hi there. Uh, thanks for this wonderful tour de force, as your friend also writes in the uh, question and answers. I had this one question uh, relating to social media. So you have a very popular uh, presence on Instagram as well. And in today's period of social media, what keeps you enthusiastic about continuing to produce hard copy books? Like, do you think there is something specific about this medium that uh, is unique to books as compared to online virtual sharing of your photographs? Oh, uh, Abby, good question. I just want to mention Abby and I not only worked on the, the Kailash book together, uh, but, but then Abby hosted me in Himachal Pradesh at his home. And then we traveled all through the Spiti Valley back in the, the summer of 2018. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I do like social media and, and it's the social media that encourages me even more to value books because it is so ephemeral. And you know, you, I'll put a photo up on Instagram or Facebook and then people will like it and a few people will make comments and then, and then, and then. And, and it's just so ephemeral. And, um, and if, you're, if you don't have a signal or you don't have a phone, uh, it, it's just so, uh, it's just this, the ether. Uh, whereas a book is something beautiful and wonderful. And a, a project I've, that, Abby, you know I've wanted to do for years, um, I worked with uh, Dalit and Janjati children, uh, high school kids in Nepal at the end of my Fulbright year. And they produced, uh, I bought several Canon cameras, distributed them with the kids. They did incredible work and they wrote poetry and they wrote stories. And my idea was to put this together as a book, print it in Nepal and get it out to every school in Nepal because schools in Nepal have no books. They have a course book, they have a paperback lesson book, but they've never seen a hardcover photo book. And to have a hardcover photo book written by, with photos by people of the untouchable Dalit community would be so powerful. And so, um, 
So I, yeah, I still see the power of books. I still see the power of artwork on walls, going to museums. Um, and um, yeah, there's only, social media only goes so far. And uh, there's a beauty to, to, the, to holding a book in, in one's hand and reading it by candlelight or by firelight or at the beach. Um, so thank you, Abby. Thank you, Ray. Okay, Gabriel, why don't you take the close for us? Kevin, that was absolutely amazing. It was such an extraordinary presentation. You've done such beautiful work. And I, and my eyes were opened not only by the photographs, but by your explanation and, and your engagement with them. I, on behalf of the Oakmont Sunday Symposium, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your work. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you all. Thanks all for stepping away on Sunday to, to be here. Okay, that'll be it for this week. And if you're coming next week, remember the daylight savings time. So you better reset your clock.